We're sitting here today in the Adam Art Gallery's current exhibition, The Machine Stops. It's an exhibition of work where students from the Wellington School of Architecture at Te Haringa Waka, Victoria University of Wellington, under the tutelage of Professor Daniel Brown, have produced allegorical architectural projects where environmental, so social and cultural concerns are manifest. The commentary to this speculative exhibition describes the representation of stories about environmental destruction, social disparities and cultural loss that offer important lessons for future generations. Prompted by the synergies of this exhibition and the current building project on the university campus, the Living Pa, the director of the Adam Art Gallery, Tina Barton, proposed today's discussion between people involved with that project. The Living Pa will redevelop the university's Marae precinct into a world-leading living building. It's founded on the twin pole, the pillars of Mataronga Māori and sustainability that will affirm the Marae, Te Heringa Waka, as being at the heart of the university. In accord with the living building challenge, it will operate separately to the infrastructural networks associated with urban development. The self-sustaining building aims to be New Zealand's most sustainable educational facility and the city's most sustainable building. Discussing the building today, we have Rhonda Thompson, Paul Harpai, Senior Advisor and Co-Project Manager to the project, Alistair Katanak, Structural Engineer and Director at Dunning Thornton Consultants, and Hugh Tennant, Co-Director at Tennant Brown Architects. Tena Koto, welcome. Rhonda Kiora, can you tell us about the context of the project? Yeah, sure. So, well, Tena Koe, Robin. Thank you for the introductions. The Living Pa is the extensive redevelopment of Te Heringa Waka Marae at Victoria University of Wellington. Um, as you've mentioned, it proposes um, a multi-purpose pa, a, a hub, um, to be one of the most sustainable buildings in the world and to be a landmark for the region. The vision for the Living Pa is Moti Apopo, um, for tomorrow, for a better tomorrow. Um, and it's really about centering um, the land and people as opposed to the building, although we will talk about a building. And it's about um, realizing our values. Um, in many ways, the visions for the Living Pa is, um, extends on the legacy of Te Heringa Waka Marae and Te Tumu Heringa Waka, um, the Whare Nui. Um, so established and built in the 1970s and 80s, um, you know, our society was uh, very different then than what it is now. There were very few Māori um, at the university and those, um, those projects were you know, really ambitious in their time. Um, the idea of a fully carved um, whare nui on a university campus was, was really radical. And, um, and in that sense, um, you know, we connect to, to the living pa, and that is the idea that we're a community, to Heringa Waka, who are looking um, to find new initiatives and in, in models to, um, to enable us to be who we um, are meant to be um, in the context of colonisation, who we want to be. Um, and, and, um, and, and more importantly, to create a better future for future generations. And so just to sort of round out my sort of comment here is, you know, Māori identity um, comes from the land and um, buildings like uh, Te Tumu Heringa Waka and the Living Pa, they say so. And, and in this sense, they're buildings that speak and they speak to, um, to uh, our commitments to the things that we're most connected to, which is the land and each other and the planet. And they also speak to, well, the Living Pa speaks to um, our commitment to um, to, to superior building practices that make restorative um, uh, buildings the norm. And I think that's possibly where some of our discussion will go today. Kia ora. Thank you. Uh, Hugh Tenakwe. Oh, kia ora, Robin. Uh, nā mihi ki a koutou katoa. Uh, nā mihi ki te, uh, te whare nei te uh, Art Gallery for hosting us today. 
and um, and also for um, is wanting to talk, talk or to support this co-papa of the of the, the living pa. Hugh, what's the living building challenge? The living building challenge um, is uh, one of the major distinctive kind of extraordinary things about this project. It's a um, it's a philosophy. Um, it seeks to advocate and create um, projects that not are, are not just bad for them. They're not not bad for the environment, but actually are regenerative. So it's it's looking to um, across the whole aspect, uh, physical, social, um, and infrastructural aspects of creating buildings. Um, and how to do that in a way that is actually a way for the future, that, that is non-harming and not only that, regenerative. Mm. So this is an extremely exciting project and incredibly ambitious in that regard um, because it's very urban, it's a very small site, very tight urban site, and some of the things that have to be achieved by the project are, for example, net zero water. All of the water systems, both the grey water, the black water, the storm water, the drinking water, all have to be managed within the confines of the site. Um, and how that relates to the local ecology. Uh, it has to generate 105% of its own energy over the year. So that it's actually, this is what it's giving back. It's going beyond what it uses and giving back to the grid in this instance. Um, there is an extremely rigorous attention to the materiality of the building mm -hmm. so that no toxic materials um, go into the building, so it's incredibly healthy. And then there are these other um, imperatives and categories that we looked at around beauty, which uplifts the human spirit and is often you know, not considered as being a thing of positive value, but actually it's a human right. It gives dignity to, to buildings, to the built environment. Uh, equity, um, health and happiness um, and this one other it's just slipped my Did mind. you say beauty huh? yeah, yeah. place place <laughs> yeah so you know and that's actually that's really what this is about a place and um, mm. the other key thing is that we're building this fari for um, for te here in Iwaka, to sit beside te tumi here in Iwaka, the beautiful carved house with all its fakairo and and it's quite a big building and colleague Alistair will dis dis discuss the rather extraordinary structure that we've got for it but the key ideas that we had for the architecture was to lift up the atea of the marae as, as part of the broader site and then connect that into the, the ground floor plane of the building so you've got a really big space to play with both inside and out in terms of large events and a sense of continuity um, to be able to see through so that Te Hiruna Waka Te Tumu, the whare, is no longer completely hidden. It's still got a sense of seclusion, but it, it's not hidden. You can see through to it and so that it's an invitation um, and a connection to it from the busy Kelvin Parade. The building appears to float in your drawings, the building appears to float above the site. Yeah, so that's the, um, the transparency on the ground floor um, and then the main body of the, the two other floors above, sitting above. And internally the key thing is to have a highly connected, both vertically and horizontally, um, environment. So it's not a whole lot of different cells, it's quite porous. And this is really consistent with Tao Māori where there is a lot of connectivity um, through age, through care, through connection, and it's the gateway. This is the gateway to the university. This is where, and the heart of the university, where many people come to be welcomed into the, um, the campus, into the life of the, of the university. And so it will become a living thing. It feels like it's really going to change everybody's experience of Calburn Parade. Every bus that goes up that road is yeah, going to have a new experience. Of the they'll have a good view in, I think, from, from in the, the bus. The building is going to house Te Kawa o Maui, Afina, student support, as well as administration for 
Yes, in Naitawira, um, and the ground floor is completely dedicated to Morai engagement activities. Yeah, so there's sort of teaching and learning on the first floor up, and Afina, which is student support, and then above that there's academic studies to Kawa Maui, um, the home of DVC Maori, sustainability on the campus. Yeah. Kia ora, Alistair. Kia ora. The world's to be a better place when the project's finished. What are the challenges that the project's um, presented to you? Well, that's kind of the exciting thing of, for us. Um, mm. We're doing the structural engineering for the, for the project, and normally when we're trying to consider the, the environment we make buildings, as you said before, we're trying to be less bad, um, and this is time we're actually trying to be good when we build the building. So it's kind of a really real paradigm shift for the, for the industry, who's been sort of stepping around environmental issues, trying to be less bad, trying to be, and, and what we're trying to do here is like, when we've made this building, the world's supposed to be a better place afterwards, which is kind of like, as an arch, overarching rule, I find really enticing because it means you're gonna try at every step to, to shift something. And that can be right from, you know, you're talking to, to the subcontractors, to the people in a shop somewhere making something, and you're telling the stories, probably not as eloquently as Hugh did, but you know, of what, what the building's trying to do. And they learn something and they do something different and then they keep doing something different and that's kind of the whole that's the whole idea of the living building challenge and it's to get that story told broadly by just educating the people involved and then people people can come and see the finished building and that will tell its own stories and we'll all sort of find that eventually um, for us structurally what well, the building is net zero carbon and there's a lot of buildings that claim to be various levels of net zero carbon, but it's all um, about where you draw the border of your environment of what, what is net zero carbon and what's not. And we don't get that luxury here because the living building challenge goes, this is, this is your site, everything's got to happen within that. Um, and so um, for us as structural engineers, um, what we're trying to do is embody as much, um, uh, embed as much carbon in the structure, um, naturally through using wood, because we're, it's sort of in like, it's offsetting the other materials we, that we want to use on the building that have greater longevity, um, that are more suitable for, where um, for their purpose, um, and therefore take the carbon emissions made from them and use them sucked into the trees, milled, we've allowed for all the losses, and then put that, put that amount of wood in the building. And so what, what that's meant for us is that um, the only concrete we've put in the whole structure is actually just joining the piles to the bottom of the columns, the pile caps. Um, we thought about trying to do them in wood, but it was extremely difficult and we worried about degradation over time and that sort of thing. But, you know, basically everything's made from wood. Um, we've got little bits of steel that connect the building together um, in lots and tens of thousands of screws. But uh, probably more importantly is um, we're in Wellington. Um, we have lots of big earthquakes. We want this building to be around for a long time. And um, as a very important building to the university, um, we've designed this building for... 130% of what normal buildings are designed for, um, and so we've got to have like little shock absorbers throughout the building that that use up the earthquake energy because you know wood's very uh, very flexible, um, it's very resilient, but it doesn't use up earthquake energy. So we've got a um, you can make your car as strong as you like, but you need some springs and shock absorbers in it. So we've put little bits of steel to be those springs and shock absorbers. There must have been lessons along the way. There must have been surprises that you didn't expect when you took the commission on. Yeah. Um, We've kind of barreled into doing several of these wood buildings over the last decade or so, um, and you go in with your kind of high hopes, and it's always harder than you think, because you know, um, you have, you've learnt, you spent your whole career learning the kind of how to just put an extra bolt or an extra tie to put these things together, and, and in some ways, I think um, the world's grappling with a new architecture in wood. Um, I don't think we've we've invented a bunch of new materials. We're using. Um, Lots of different types of relaminated wood in this building. We've got your normal old sawn up timber. Um, we've got timber that's glue laminated together, so that's just cut into strips and glued together in one direction. We've got big panels that are glued together with wood all in one direction. We've glued it in uh, cross laminated timber, we've glued it in other directions. And we've got laminated Verlian lumber, which is made in a big machine that compresses it as well as gluing it together. So we can spread these around the building and put them where we need it engineering wise um, with the grain and the most important thing is that then and getting the grain pointing in the right direction and then that's what holds the building up so that's that's 
I think we're, as a world, we're still learning how to do that. We can do that well, how to do it really well. And so we've, we've gone on a bit of a journey with this building and created some slightly different forms. The columns are bigger than most buildings, um, but you know, that's been part of how we've tried to integrate the architecture, it into the architecture and, the, and that feeling of place and solidity. And there's less um, of them. Yeah. And, so, and it's part of the flow through the building and how that's framed. And so it takes a bit more thinking, not just from us, but uh, architecturally and a lot more corridor between us to, to make sure that's all put in the right place. Mm. As someone who works in the School of Architecture, it's going to be a great teaching tool mm. because the things you're talking about are going to be clearly manifest for people passing through. There will yeah, be well, lessons within the building. Yeah. Rhonda, you've been with the project almost from the start. Mm. What's, what's been your experience through, through, the, through the project? My experience? Well, I mean, it's been, you know, really positive. Um, and there's been lots of learnings. I think um, it's been particularly beneficial um, uh, to, to learn about the benefits of applying holistic models and sort of working in integrated approaches. Um, and the benefits of that. Um, so, you know, I say holistic model, so the living building chatted West, you know, Western or North American holistic model with um, all of those performance areas that, that Hugh spoke about. Um, it also sort of mish, mashed up with an indigenous perspective that kind of provides something that's old, but again, in the backdrop of colonization, it's also new and fresh. Mm. Mm. And um, and it, it, it sort of it shows me that actually, although we're a small community, that we can actually be world leaders in doing something um, globally important. Um, the, the you know the world has changed, and there's so many widely accepted models that are being really interrogated. And um, you know, we're facing some of the biggest challenges that our, you know, our species has ever confronted. And, and you know, while a, a global pandemic rages, um, and I, I won't go into that, but it's intensified our, our challenge. Yeah. Um, we are also um, challenged by um, this changing climate and inequalities, right? And I guess this project has really solidified my thinking around how we know to know that government and lawmakers can't do it by themselves and actually takes um, if i'm representative of a developer client and innovators and industry to work with communities and um, and um, and focus on the collective rather than sort of individual need and to and, and the benefit of being Taking, taking the risk to be the innovator, mm. um, to to show how something can be done, um, and so I mean you know yeah quite quite they are the sort of things I'm taking away from this project. Interesting how Māori are leading the the uh, application of the building living building challenge in Aotearoa because the value of the kaitiaki tanga it's a value that's not to be compromised. Uh, well, you know, it's to be upheld and the Living Building Challenge is a really good structure to do that. And so um, with Ngai Tuhoi, you know, they've done the, the only other fully certified, well, we're not fully certified yet, that's our job over the next few years. Yeah. You've got to be Long in road. the building for a year to get Bear certification. Okay. Yeah. And when, when will that be? Uh, so we're going to be... A year after we finish, a couple of years. So it's going to finish in 24, and then so a year after that. So you basically, it's not just about designing and saying, isn't this a great design and this ticks all the boxes, it's actually about testing whether it actually does meet net zero energy, net zero water. Mm. Um, and also people are interviewed, you know, about, the, about their experience of the building. Really comprehensive. But just coming back to the, the, so far the value of it, the, the underlying value, is that, um, is that th this is actually going to be an exemplar, and hopefully not too late, because to inspire others to go, oh, actually, um, we can't keep building in this way, because climate change is a, just a symptom of this sort of ecological overreaching that's going on. Um, 
in, in so many areas, you know, in the oceans, mm. on the land, in the waterways. And um, the Living Building Challenge really turns to face into that ecological overreach. And, and we still, we're going to be building new things. We're still putting a lot of aluminium on the roof with all the PVs, but um, there's a whole um, sort of imperative around buying local and measuring the amount of carbon to, for things to travel. So we're not, we're trying to use local materials. Um, and and that, well, that's measured on the job. Um, yeah, so what you're going to have is this high-performing, human-focused, mm. natural, healthy, plant-covered, resilient um, place to be in. Um, and, I mean, and the other really most beautiful thing is that it's connected to the whole Ulakawa protocol and tikanga of the marae as a place to, to be and um, engage with Tom Māori and be the home of Tom Māori in the, on the campus. Pretty cool. I think what Hugh was saying before about it being an example is really important for people in the, um, who are looking to develop or construct or, or design these buildings because um, you can read about things, you can talk about them, but if you're actually tasked with designing it and putting it down and putting one up, you've got to have a certain confidence. And um, certainly things that we've done that have been quite different, it's taken, for them to take off, it takes a lot of people to, to go there, to touch it, to feel it, to jump around mm -hmm. on it, to understand what it's about. And I think that's a really important role for, for this building and what it's trying to achieve. Um, it's great that it's a, very, a place that a lot of people can come to um, and then everything yeah. that Hugh's talking about, you know, it's like it draws people into the, the whole, um, the whole uh, culture, the ideals of what um, Taranga Walk yeah. is about. So, um, yeah, no, I think that having something you can touch and feel is really important to, you know, quite a lot of people in the building industry are quite conservative, you know, and so it's like you go, no, but it's here. It's like you can do it. Mm. I love that Taranga Walk will be at the heart of the university. Um, that you can take this cavern of a street and turn it on its ear and create and, and expose the heart of the, of the university like this. And on that site, that is the location of the headwaters of the Kumutofu stream that, again, has been, been lost. And, and like this exhibition, un, 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 unfolding layers of, um, of narrative and giving us new understanding about the the world that was, but the world that we are in, and how to understand where we're going. I think mm. it's really, really, um, mm. it's certainly enriched my experience learning about the project already. Yeah, I'm I think it's, it's a hopeful thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're trying to find the headwaters of the, screen, of the stream while we're piling at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> we knew it was there, and now we're trying to probe with the timber piles to find out where the bottom is. I've got some photos. Yeah, yeah. The top so that's about you. nine meters, nine to twelve meters down at one end of the site. So you know that's it's that's the challenge of working in an urban environment. You know, it's made it's really it's difficult in the architecturally it's different, difficult structurally. So that's why it's braver to do something here than in a um, in a flat site where you've got lots of space. You know, but I think it's for that extra determination and the extra cost. Unfortunately, that that incurs. I think it's going to be worth it for the effect. Um, well, you asked me in my experience of Tane Atua, and that was um, quite early um, in my involvement in the project. And it, it, um, it was important for me at the time, and I think for the other people in, that went, so it was important for me at the time and the other people that went because we'd been looking at the Living Building ch Challenge very much as a paper-based framework. And you know, you talk about touching um, it, people at Tennant Brown and at Dunning Thornton talked to me about the building being an educationist in its own right, and that you learn how to operate the building once you're in it. And so to go and visit the at that time it was the only um, fully certified living building in the Southern Hemisphere. There may be one or two others now, several years forward. Um, it 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 was to see um, people in the building, um, and, and Māori people in the building, um, uh, uh, and living in it, experiencing it, and making it something. So um, 
before it sort of before that it seems sort of quite a, a foreign sort of thing but when you see the uh, the people of that place there and they're extending their manaki within the building and uh, um, and how much they're learning about how they 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 live in the building um, and how how real it was for them that's when it became for me um, a project where I could see it as being about people as opposed to a plan or um, something that we were importing from somewhere else. Mm. We're, very, we're very fortunate to have here as our DBC Māori, Rowania Higgins. And that's a really nice connection that you're making there, Robin, because um, the building that I'm talking about is, um, is something that was um, developed by Tuhoi, and of course they had their own um, design teams, and um, Rowania um, was a, a, a trustee of um, uh, uh, um, at the time when Tuhu were doing that development, and so she saw something more than a building. She saw what um, this framework does for community and for people, mm. and so um, that's you know another thing too. There are um, some really great models out there um, that we don't need to always kind of like create the wheel. It's about connecting with really um, fantastic stuff, holistic stuff that's already out there. And you can put your own spin on it. Mm. And, um, and indeed, I'm just going to go on because that's what Tuhui have done. They started with one building, um, full certification, went to others that could probably achieve partial certification should they want to. Mm. But then have done a whole bunch of other community initiatives based on what the building has taught them and mm. all their process. Um, and that is impact, and that's the potential um, for us, whether we're in our, whatever industry or sector we're in, the potential is what it can teach us so that we can then extend further and influence further. And um, it's also the challenge. Challenge never stops. Mm. Could you tell us more about Morte Apopo? So, I mean, it really is just about, Morte Apopo is about the future focus of of this project and it's about connecting and um, we know that young people are, are more socially conscious and um, uh, of environmental and social issue um, perhaps ever before um, and they are, are worried about the future of Papatuanuku or the planet and that is not an easy thing so um, a lot of this is about um, our responsibility to be a good ancestor um, and um, to create a better future um, and engaging young people in creating that better future. Which is what Tehuanga Waka was all about in 1980 when the first building was C built. Certainly, certainly. I mean, that is it. that's why we, we really see in many ways, the vision for the living part is not new, it's old, it's recycled. But so, so, mm. so wise and so good was the vision of those uh, leaders in the 1970s and 80s. I guess it speaks something to in, in some part about how a lot of um, Māori collective um, aspiration hasn't changed. Um, but also that they're, they're good, you know, that, that, that they stand the test of time. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think I am part of a community that finds um, that very grounding and something that we can, can get behind. Rhonda, Alistair, Hugh, kia ora. Yeah, kia ora Robin. Thank you Robin. Namihi.